Jeffy, would you like to come and give a word of greeting? We love it when you do. Jeffy is from Nogaland. We love you. Hello, church. Hello. Are you still on fire for God? Amen. 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 Praise God. It's so good to be back uh, to our families. You are our partners, our co-workers. And thank you for praying for us and holding the rope for us. And uh, uh, we are so blessed to be back uh, home. And uh, we just love our friend, our pastor, Denise, and their two kids, Nathan and Christiana, and uh, all of you. And so um, this morning, uh, you know, as you have seen in the video, we have graduated uh, recently in the um, June 2nd, uh, 103 students. 113 students, yes, from all over, like uh, India, Bhutan, Nepal, Myanmar, and uh, you know, just God is working everywhere in the world. Amen. And uh, you know, we have to just obey and step out and do the will of God wherever we are. Amen. Here in Colonel Beach, there in India, wherever we are. Preach the gospel, it will never end. Preaching the gospel will never end until Jesus comes back. Amen? Amen. Amen. So thank you, church, for having us. We love you. Amen. I'm going to introduce you now, and then we're going to let the kids go. But anyhow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyhow, he's a graduate of Raymond Bible Training Center. You're on television over in India. But not right now, but you were. I mean, this... This couple has affected India and all these countries that you would think nobody could get into. Isn't that exciting? So we're going to let the children go, take a minute, say hi to somebody, and then we'll give it to Pastor. All right. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. How many of you are glad you're here today? Can I see your hand? All right. Look at someone sitting near to you and say, you are so blessed. You are so blessed. You're sitting next to me. Praise the Lord. Amen. It's an honor to be here. It's a joy and a privilege. And I echo what my wife said a moment ago. We've had a wonderful year, a very fruitful year. And it's amazing to see how God is doing so many things there in that part of the world. And uh, those folks are on fire for God. Hallelujah. It's, it's amazing. Well, I want to share with you from my heart. Let me just remind you, if you want to know more about our ministry, you're, you're welcome to check out our website. The URL is sophie.life.com. S-O-F-I stands for Spirit of Faith International, sophie.life, and you can even download some messages uh, from us if, if that would interest you for free, and you can check out other things as well, and thank you again for having us. It is an honor, always an honor to be here, we love this church dearly, we love your pastors sincerely, and we have uh, experienced many wonderful things together over the years, and it's hard to believe that it's been almost 30 years. Of course, I was only 12 years old the first time I came, but anyways, God is doing great things. I want you to turn with me, please, to the book of Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16. And while you're turning, we'll just have a word of prayer. Father, we come to you in the precious name of Jesus. We thank you for the power of your word, sharper than a two-edged sword, full of life-changing power. I pray and believe today that every ear is a listening ear, every mind is an undistracted mind, and every heart is a receptive heart. I ask that he that speak would speak as the oracles of God, and may he that minister do so with the ability that you furnish, so that in all things Jesus Christ may be glorified. Father, you know where we are, and you know where we need to be, and you know how to take us there. So, Father, lead us in the way that we should go, and give to us what we do not have. Restore to us what has been taken away from us, and bring clarity and unction as we share your word. Thank you, Father, and we believe not one person will leave this place untouched or unchanged. And for all these things, we give you praise. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Someone say, Amen. Amen. I'm going to read this verse to you. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. I'm going to read from the English Standard Version, but you follow me in your Bible, or the big Bible on the wall. It says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. 
I feel led some way or another to go in this direction. I'm sure we have shared similar things before and many of the things that we will share today are not something new, but sometimes we do need to be reminded and God can add to what we already know. To be Christ-like and to overcome sin, to live a holy life, to have unity and harmony with others and fellowship with the Father, we must walk by the Spirit. And if we would do this, it would solve so many problems for us. I remember several years ago, I was praying about uh, uh, some trouble that I was experiencing and the Lord spoke to me and said, Walking in the flesh got you in this mess and walking in the Spirit will get you out. Yeah. And that's so true. Now the Greek word translated Spirit, New Testament was originally written in the Greek language. The, new, the Greek word translated Spirit is pneuma. And it can refer either to the Holy Spirit or to your human spirit. We have to determine from the context which one is meant. I personally believe in this verse and in this passage, Paul is referring to your born-again human spirit. At any rate, it's the Holy Spirit who dwells in your spirit and is working through your spirit. When we say walk in the spirit or walk by the spirit, this is not something mystical or something unattainable. It's not having a vision. It's not being caught up into heaven. While a Christian could experience something like this, certainly not. Certainly, it's not going to happen to everyone and not every day. Right. Paul has something much more simple and direct in mind. To walk by the Spirit simply means to follow your heart, your inward man. Let me read you another translation, the God's Word translation. It says, live your life as your spiritual nature directs you. Live your life as your spiritual nature directs you. Now when we say, listen to your heart, some Christians are quick to respond, but the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? You see, they're quoting from the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 17, verse 9. And that's true, that's what that verse says. But later in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 31, God said, Behold, the days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. You see, we today, we are new covenant people. We're not living under the old covenant. And he went on to say in verse 33, the same chapter, I will... Put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. See, God did more than erase our sin. He changed us within. We could substitute the word law in that verse with the word nature. In other words, God said, I will place my own nature within their hearts. Every born again child of God has eternal life. Do you know this verse? 1 John chapter 5, verse 12. It says, whoever has the Son has life. The Greek word translated life in this verse is zoe. Zoe. According to Vine's expository dictionary of New Testament words, it's a common reference. According to Vine's, zoe means life as God has it. When John says whoever has the Son... He means the Son of God, doesn't he? Well, notice, he also says, has life. Literally, in Greek, has the life. He means the life of God. Whoever has the Son of God has the life of God. He's not talking about just natural life. Even sinners have that. Zoe is the life of and the nature of God imparted to a man's spirit through Christ. You see, when we talk about eternal life, the word eternal refers not so much to the duration of this life, but the quality of this life. Because only spiritual things are eternal. Amen. See, some Christians say, no, we'll only get eternal life when we get to heaven. Well, will you only get the sun when you get to heaven? 
Because John said, whoever has, present tense, the Son, has, present tense, the life. Can I get an amen? amen. Hallelujah. But John, 1 John 5, 12 goes on to say, whoever does not have the Son does not have the life. We're not telling sinners who are spiritually dead to follow their heart. Paul in Galatians is writing to believers. Yes. Now, if walking in the Spirit or by the Spirit is the single greatest or biggest solution, walking in the flesh is the single biggest problem. It's real quiet in this Presbyterian church. I said walking in the flesh is the single biggest problem. Some people want to blame everything on the devil. And I know there's a devil out there and you have to deal with them. But consider this. The book of Romans in the New Testament is one of the most comprehensive books in the New Testament. And the word Satan is found only one time in 16 chapters. The word demon or devil is not found at all. But the word flesh is found 23 times. May I suggest to you, you're going to have 23 times more trouble with your flesh than with the devil. Amen. Amen. Some people are casting out devils. Really, God just wants you to stop acting like the devil. The Greek word for flesh is the word sarks. Sarks. And in this context, no, not everywhere, but in this context, in the verses we read, it means more than just the physical body. It really means, it really refers to the sinful tendency of the body. It is the corrupt human nature that is in the flesh. Now some Christians say, the body doesn't have a nature. It's just a piece of meat. And you can just train it to do whatever you want it to do. But that's not what the Bible teaches us. For example, in Romans chapter 7, verse 23, Paul said, I see in my members. Now, he doesn't mean the church members. He said, I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin, the law of sin that dwells in my members. The word members means the parts of your body. Really, it means your physical senses. The problem is not with your liver and your kidneys and your intestines. The problem is with what you see, what you feel, what you touch and taste. That's, that's really the problem, see? So notice here, we can substitute the word law with the word nature. So that means even Paul, an apostle, a man who wrote half the New Testament said, the nature of sin dwells in my body. Now you might say, some might say, yeah, but in Romans 7, Paul is talking about his experience before Christ. Well, I'm not sure, but it doesn't matter. You didn't get a new body after Christ. Amen. You got the same body you've always had. And it's got the same sinful tendency that it's always had. Yeah. Are you out there today? Yeah. Let me give you another verse. In James chapter 3, verse 6, the Bible says, The tongue is set on fire by hell. What does that mean? That means it's sinful. That means if you do not bridle your mouth, if you do not control your tongue, you're going to burn down everything God has given you. Amen. He went on to say the tongue is a, is a deadly poison. So how many people have you poisoned this week? Don't raise your hand. He went on to say in verse 8, James 3 verse 8, and no human being can tame the tongue. So that means you, you can't control the flesh with just mere human willpower. It takes zoe. It takes the life of God. Can I get another amen? amen. Let's go back to our text. Galatians 5.16. I'm going fast because i got a lot to say. and I guess I could say half of what I have to say, but I'm not coming back next week, and I feel like I should say what I have to say. <laughs> Galatians 5.16 again says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Notice this verse does not say if you walk in the Spirit, your flesh will never want anything bad. It didn't say that. It says you will not gratify those desires. You will still feel the pull of the flesh, but you won't give in to that if you're walking by the Spirit. You see, it's not a sin to be tempted. Even Jesus was tempted. It's only a sin when you yield to the temptation. 
there's a difference between encountering temptation and entering in. We cannot pray that you'll never encounter temptation. You're going to encounter temptation. Some of you are tempted right now to leave. But you, you, you don't have to yield to that temptation. Amen. And I've heard some Christians say this. I've heard some Christians say, Well, actually, my spirit never sins. Only my flesh. Oh. Friend, your outward man does not operate independently of your inward man. When you sin, and of course I know that hasn't happened recently, but when you sin, it's because you, the real you, which is a spirit, chose to fulfill the desires, sinful desires of your flesh and mind. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So it's kind of like the story, I've said this before, but you'll forgive me for repeating myself. It's like the story of the Christian who got a speeding ticket and he told the judge, you see, in my heart, I did not want to break the law, but my flesh, you know, disobeyed. <laughs> and the judge said, that's fine. I'll put your flesh in jail and your spirit can go free. <laughs> <laughs> then again... Then again, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 7, 1, 2 Corinthians 7, 1 says, Since we have these promises, beloved, and those are promises to live holy, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit. If you only sin with your body, why would sin defile your spirit? Then again, 1 John 1, 9, a familiar verse which is written to believers, not written to sinners, written to believers, says, If we... Not if them in the world, if we in the church, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When God forgives us, which part of us does He cleanse? Does He just cleanse your body? Well, you can go take a bath. Take a shower this morning. I'm now cleansed. I hope you did that. That's a good idea. But actually, it's your spirit that is cleansed. Are you out there today? Let's continue on going back to Galatians then. Galatians chapter 5, we read verse 16. Let me read verse 17 because I want to go through a couple of these verses in the time I have. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. You see, every Christian experiences that conflict. The guy who said, and said he didn't is lying about it. Every, every Christian, every, every holy saint of God experiences this conflict. No matter how long you've known the Lord or, or how many Bible verses you know, there is a part of you that wants to do wrong and there's a part of you that wants to do what's right. I'm talking about believers now. So here's the dilemma. Here's the problem. If you satisfy the fleshly desires, we're talking about sinful desires. It's not a sin, you know, you're, you're hungry, and, you know, that's not a sin, you're sleepy, that's not a sin, unless you're sleepy now, of course. But, but, but <laughs> Jesus was sleepy, Jesus was hungry. We're talking about sinful desires, wrong desires, see. So if you, if you satisfy the sinful desires of the flesh, your heart will resent it. See, it may feel good, but your conscience, which is the voice of your spirit, will be troubled. You see, the born-again child of God is a marked man, and he can never completely enjoy sin. Christians can sin. You, you don't need to write that down in your notebook. You know it already. Christians can sin. But you see, when a Christian sins, he's going against his own inward nature. That's why the backslidden Christian, the Christian out of fellowship with God, is not happy. He's yeah. miserable. Part of him is enjoying this, but part of him is deeply troubled. Yeah. Hallelujah. But, on the other hand, if you endeavor to fulfill the righteous desires of your spirit, your flesh will fight it every step of the way. That's why some people didn't come to church this morning. I wanted to come this morning. I really did, but uh, I was tired. Who was talking? Your flesh. <laughs> I know I should pray more, but I've really been busy lately. Who's talking? Your flesh. <laughs> I wanted to give more in the offering, but there's a really good TV at Walmart. Who's talking? Your flesh. <laughs> it's real quiet in here. Is this mic on? Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So that means no matter what you do, part of you, and I'm talking about you as a whole person, part of you is not going to be happy. 
And it also means you cannot walk in the flesh and in the spirit at the same time. There's no third option. It's a binary choice. Like male or female. There's only two choices. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So if you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. That simply means you won't sin. You will not sin. But if you walk in the flesh, you will not fulfill the desires of the Spirit. You will not do the will of God. So by walking in the flesh, you can completely sabotage the plan of God for your life. I've got a vision. I've got dreams. You know, I've got a word for it. Yeah, but if you continue living carnally, you will never finish your race. It's not going to happen just because God wills it. You have to also will it. Amen. Can I get an amen? amen? So that means every moment of every day, we have to make a choice. Whether we're going to walk according to the inward nature in our spirit. I'm talking to Christians now. Or let our fleshly nature dominate us. And of course, most of us, I can only speak for myself. I know this doesn't pertain to you all. But most of us switch back and forth several times throughout the day. Uh -oh. That's why we have Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde believers. <laughs> Some of my church members in Nogland on Sunday look like angels. You think they're growing angels' wings, but it's actually just their shoulder blades sticking out. And on Monday, they look like they're growing horns. You meet them, you meet them in the Walmart, you don't even recognize them. <laughs> I don't know, I'm not picking on Walmart today. But anyways, hallelujah. <laughs> or McDonald's or whatever, hallelujah. So let's go on verse 18, Galatians chapter 5, verse 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. You see, the man who walks by the Spirit doesn't need the law. Because he has a higher law inscribed upon his own heart. The Bible says in Romans chapter 7, verse 6, this is one of my favorite verses, or it helps me a lot. It says, we died to the law so that we should serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. See, the, the, the Old Testament law was a series, was, was incentivized by a series of, of punishment and reward. But I'm not motivated by punishment and reward. I have God's nature inside me. I want to do what's right, right. in my heart. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Listening to me? So in other words, God's not using a carrot and stick on me because he doesn't need to. No. Now if you're walking by the flesh, you're going to have to be under the law. Amen. Amen. Let's move on. It's real quiet today. I'm glad I'm here. <laughs> glad you're here. Verse 19. We're not done yet. Now the works of the flesh are evident. So in other words, this is what it looks like when you're walking in the flesh. And it's no mystery. See, people act like, I wonder if I'm in the flesh. Well, we can tell. It's not, it's not, you're the only one that doesn't know. <laughs> he goes on to say in verse 19 to 21, sexual immorality impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. That's what it looks like. That's what it looks like. And don't, don't, don't get angry with me. If you don't like what you see in the mirror, don't get angry with the mirror. Notice he said sexual immorality. Isn't it funny? That's the very first thing. First thing. Boom. Right off the top. He didn't hide it somewhere in the middle. Right off the top. Sexual immorality. Let me say this. I have to speak rather frankly to you. Sex is not a sin. In fact, you'll forgive me for saying this, but the very first commandment God gave to Adam and Eve was to have sex. Somebody looking like, oh, what kind of church is this? Well, the Bible, the Bible says in Genesis 1.28, God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean plant a vegetable garden and practice your math homework. <laughs> if you don't know what that means, ask Pastor Denise after the service. And she'll explain it to you in more detail. <laughs> Sex is not a sin. Sexual immorality is a sin. That's having sex with someone other than your spouse. See, Genesis 2, 25 says that Adam and Eve were husband and wife. They're not boyfriend and girlfriend. The word boyfriend is not in the Bible. 
Sometimes we see people in the world, they say, my man been cheating on me. We find out, it's not their husband, it's just their boyfriend. The word boyfriend has no status in heaven. Girlfriend is not found in the Bible. Husband, wife, that means something to God. Those things don't mean anything. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Please sit down. <laughs> Jesus said, I, I know I've shared this before, but Jesus said to the woman at the well of Samaria, you have had five husbands and the one you have now is not your husband. Amen. Just because you're living with some cowboy, that don't make him your husband. Amen. But the Lord knows we're connected in the spirit. The Lord knows you're lying. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Lord, I was born at night, but it wasn't last night. <laughs> Let's move on. He said impurity. I'm not going to go through all these. I know some of you look really concerned right now. Walk in the Spirit. Just walk in the Spirit. <laughs> impurity. This has something to do with our thinking. Yeah. See, Philip's translation says impurity of mind. The passion translation says lustful thoughts and pornography. See, some people think, well, it doesn't matter what you think as long as you don't do it. Ooh. That's not true. I used to be a car salesman. My family was in the car business. And so people would come onto the car lot and I'd say, can I help you? And they'd say, I'm just looking. i say, that's how it starts. <laughs> I'm just looking. Yeah, that's how it starts. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's move on. Praise the Lord. The Message Bible says, stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage. Now that describes a lot of people I know. Not you. All those people didn't come this morning. <laughs> Sensuality. That means being indecent, seductive, and lewd. If it's wrong for a man to be immoral, it's equally wrong for a woman to entice him. That's right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I don't know. Not you guys. And I honestly mean not you guys. But I, I mean, I see, you know, online, you know, even some people from our church, you know, and they'll have this sort of sultry picture posted online, social media, you know, kind of kind of suggestive, you know. <laughs> and, you know, and... And then they'll say, but the, 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 the profile says, lover of God, follower of Jesus, <laughs> and Aquarius. <laughs> that's, a, you see, that, that's wrong too. Can I get the Kindle or something? Come on. Idolatry. I see most of you, you think about like, yeah, India, a lot of idolatry. Well, um... Idolatry means loving anything more than God. Right. I mean, I mean, probably nobody down here, you know, burning incense to a statue or something like that. But some people practically worship their career. Yes. Ephesians five five says a covetous man is an idolater. Right. I, I was with a friend of mine, a Christian friend of mine, and his cell phone rang, and it, the ringtone was money, 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 money. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know, you know, I mean, I'm not saying that's wrong or anything, but it struck me, it's kind of funny, it makes me wonder what you're thinking about all day long. Like, did say Jesus, 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 it said money. Some people would, you know, sell their grandma to make a buck. <laughs> don't look around. <laughs> Sorcery. I'm not going to go through all these. Sorcery is the Greek word pharmakia. Does that sound familiar? It's where we get the word pharmacy. See, it means to take potions to alter behavior. It means using narcotics. See, some people say, well, my addiction is really a sickness. No, the Bible says it's the lust of the flesh. See, there's no more responsibility for a sickness. Somebody sneezed on you and now you have a cold. That's not a sin. Come on. Let's move on. <laughs> drunkenness, drunkenness and orgies have to do with, with wild drinking parties. Come on. People say, let's party. Okay, let's go to church tonight. No, not that kind of party. Um, so, here's the thing. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 to 21, the verse I just read to you, 
Paul lists 15 sins. Yep. He says there's more, but here's a list. Three of them are sexual in nature. Three of them have to do with drugs and alcohol. Yep. One of them has to do with greed. But eight of them have to do with strife. Mm. Uh, Half the list. Right. Isn't that funny? Why do you suppose the Apostle Paul listed it that way? Because many Christians would never dream of taking drugs or committing adultery. But they have enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalry, dissensions, and divisions, and envy every day. Come on, if there was someone working in this church and you know we found out that they're you know uh, in an illicit affair with someone or or they're you know they're mainlining heroin, we would say you know you need to step down from your position. We need to we need to minister to you. We need counseling like that. But you know people have strife in their home, and that's just a, that's just a fact of life. No big deal. Maybe we should send some people to strife rehab. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Why do Christian marriages fail? Why do churches split? Why do Christian business partnerships go awry? It's not because they're walking in the Spirit. Let me read to you another scripture. First Corinthians chapter. It's really lonely up here. It's just me and Jesus up here. You don't know how lonely I am. I wish there was a back door right here. I'm measuring the distance to the exit right now. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3 says this, For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? See, in other words, Christians who let their fleshly nature dominate them live no differently than sinners. That's why the world's confused. Especially like in Virginia. The, 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 well, it's changing, of course, but to, you know, many places the church is so worldly and the world is so churchy, you can't tell them apart. Whoa. Amen. Whoa. Hallelujah. So, Paul said this to the Corinthians. That means even if you're filled with the Holy Spirit and speak with tongues, even if you have gifts of the Spirit operating in your church, even if you have revelation knowledge of the Word of God, if there's strife in your life, you're carnal. Now we'll take a break. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's go back to Galatians. I'm almost done. Hang tight. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. But the fruit. Somebody say fruit. fruit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, Faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. See, the word fruit means end result. Yeah. Final product. Talk about the fruits of our labor, see. This is what happens when you live life as your spiritual nature directs you. And this is a very good description of God's nature. Isn't it interesting, if you look at this real carefully, this verse does not say... And the fruits of the Spirit are. Wow. It doesn't say that. It says, oh. but the fruit, singular, of the Spirit is. Even in Greek, that's what it says. These are not nine different things. This is one thing. Yeah. Like an orange. Every orange has ten segments. So God's nature has nine sections all joined together to form the whole. What that means is you really cannot have one without the other. Well, what is God's nature? If you want to sum it up in one word, John, 1 John 4, 8 says God is love. That's the most, that's the most predominant characteristic of God. It's not His power. It's not His, his, his ability. It's His love. And where there is love, there is joy. Yeah. Where there is love, there is peace. We have a whole chapter on the subject. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 4 says, Love is patient and kind. If I was writing 1 Corinthians 13, that's not the first word that I would use. I would say, Love is wonderful. Love is warm. Love is so great. But he said it's patient. Yeah. 
Nobody gets excited. About it. That's the first word he yeah. used to describe love. It's patient. Yeah. See, some people say, I really love my husband, but I just have no patience with him. That's not love. He's got this saying, love is patient. So you don't have any patience, that's not love. <laughs> and he said, love, it's, it's patient and kind. The word kindness in Greek, in Galatians, means to be useful. So that means if you walk in the Spirit, you won't be a bum. Uh -oh. <laughs> You'll be an asset. You'll be useful. It means, it means more than being polite, it means helping others. So that means if you live your life as your inward nature directs you, you will constantly be doing little acts of kindness for other people. Yeah. That's God's nature. He's always doing little acts of kindness for you, helping you yeah. find a parking place, uh, you know, getting you up this morning, you know, and, and are, are you glad you, you woke up this morning? There's a bunch of people in this world that did not wake up this morning. <laughs> Amen. Goodness has to do with generosity. See, if you walk in the Spirit, you won't be stingy. Yeah. Amen. Thank you for that one amen. amen. Come on, some people are so tight they squeak when they walk. <laughs> you won't be a miser. Love gives. For God so loved, He gave. He gave. Hallelujah. Then again, why are so, so many Christians unreliable? You cannot depend on them. They never keep their promises because faithfulness is a result of walking in the Spirit. Faithfulness has to do with commitment. Following through on your commitments. Some Christians say, well, I believe in Jesus, but I'm not going to be tied down to one particular church. That's like saying, I believe in marriage, but I'm not going to be tied down to one particular woman. What? What, what, that's not marriage. <laughs> there ain't a woman on this earth that would say amen to that. <laughs> See, some of you are shaking your head right now. So, to, get, to cut to the chase, if we let our inward nature dominate us, we will not do the works of the flesh. Right? That's what he's saying. So what he means is this. The way we overcome immorality is with love. Yeah. I might say, no, Brother John, that's why they had an affair. They fell in love. Love's not a hole. You don't fall in it. Right. That's not what the Bible calls love. Right. What the Bible calls love is always concerned about the welfare of others first. It puts others before self. That's what the Bible calls lust. Are you listening to me? Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. And joy. Joy. We're not only really called to walk in love, we're called to walk in joy. Hallelujah. You ever think about that? You're, you're, God wants you to live a life of joy. Yes. Amen? That means some people who, who pride themselves in being holy are joyless. Yeah. Wow. We don't spit, we don't chew, we don't date girls that do, you know, but they have no joy either. <laughs> They have no joy. Amen. <laughs> See, we should be serious. I, I'm trying to be serious. I have to put some humor in there because a little sugar helps the medicine go down. But, but we should be serious but not sour. Right? You shouldn't walk around Colonial Beach looking like you've been sucking on a lemon all day long. And certainly don't go evangelizing looking like that. We're here to tell you about Jesus. Oh, God. I already have a your denture loose or what's going on over there? <laughs> Amen. See, the joy of the Lord is your strength. So that means if you don't have any joy, you don't have any strength. That means you're a weak Christian. Come on, some people, some people, people should be able to look at you and tell something good is happening in your life. I think the enemy wants us to focus on the one or two or three things that are not going so well. And that's all we think about. Yeah. We just absorb. You forget about all the wonderful things God has done for you. If you treat life like a blessing, it'll feel like a blessing. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. I just came from India. Trust me, I'm glad I'm here. <laughs> I'm really glad I'm here. I don't care. I don't care You know where we eat lunch today. We go to McDonald's. I'm glad I'm here. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. If you don't believe me, just come. When I go back, you can join me. 
I'll make a believer out of you. You'll be glad you're here. You'll, you'll come back with a big smile on your face. I'm glad I'm here. Is it too hot, too cold, too hot, hard, too soft? No, everything is perfect. <laughs> See, sin might be enjoyable, but it's not joyful. Peace, a heart at rest. So you don't need drugs. You have fellowship with the Most High. Hallelujah. You high, the Most High. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. So if you walk in these things, if you're see, whenever you're tempted to drink, you need more of the Holy Ghost. Amen. You need more of, of God's joy. Yeah. You need more of His peace. Come on. See? If you spend more time shouting unto the Lord, you'll spend less time shouting at your husband. Right. Come on. Good. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. In other words, when your heart is satisfied in God, the allure of the world fades. Right. The reason people... I remember years ago in Nagaland, we visited a church. And uh, in, in Nagaland, not our church, another church. And... Uh, and uh, the, the man that was the village chief got up in the service and he just scolded everybody and it wasn't uh, it wasn't anointed, it's just anointed, you know, and, and he just just chewed everybody out and it was just like you could see the people going further and further down in their church pew. And, uh, and it was real dry and, and, and harsh. And then when the service was over, me and Jeffy went to visit the same man who testified. It, we went to visit him uh, about some, some work we had to do and he's lit up with two bottles. He and a compadre, they're all, their faces are shining like, you know, a red, a, you know, taillights on a 57 Chevy. And uh, <laughs> they're all lit up. And the moral of the story is, if your church is dry, when you get home, you'll be tempted to get wet. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you're satisfied in God, you don't need those things. You don't need that cheap substitute. You've got joy, something better. These men are not drunk with new wine. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Hallelujah! Yeah. Can I get an amen? Yeah. See? So in closing, if you ask most people, what do you want from life? I mean, maybe at first they'll say, more money, or something like that. But it actually isn't money that you no, want. You want to buy something. I mean, you could have a bank full of money and die. That don't do anything for you. No. You want to do something with that money. You want to buy something. Go somewhere, buy something. And it isn't even the thing you want to buy. No. You want the enjoyment from the thing. Right. Come on. Isn't that right? Come Think on. about it. Come on. So what you really want is joy. Yeah. What you really want is love and uh -huh. peace. That's what you really want. If you think about it, that's what you really want. That's the fruit of the Spirit. So that means if you will live your life as that Zoe nature of God in you directs, you'll be happy. You'll be satisfied. You'll breathe out your last breath, not being frustrated and bitter, but being full and satisfied. <laughs> I think it's Charles Spurgeon who said it's not how much we have that brings us happiness, but how much we enjoy. Are you listening to me? Yeah. This is the great challenge for every one of us. And I'll raise my hand saying, me number one, to walk by the Spirit every day. But if we do this, life will be better, not only for us, but for everyone we come in contact with. Yeah. Amen. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this life. You have given birth to our spirits by your precious Holy Spirit. We are children of God, not in name only, but with the character and the nature of God imparted to our spirits. Help us, Father God, to feed our inward man on your word to fellowship with you in prayer and in worship, and to fellowship with other believers in, in church, in communion with other believers, so that our spirits will be strong, and we will continually live life as our inward nature directs us. And now, Father, I just pray for this church, I pray for everyone here, that you'll help us all to fulfill the plan of God for our lives. 
And if there are those here this morning who are not where they should be with God, I ask that you would speak to their hearts. While your head is bowed in an attitude of prayer, maybe you're a child of God born again, but maybe you're not walking with the Lord as you should be. I'm not going to give an altar call in the traditional sense, but I will just pray for you. If you feel like, yeah, this message was definitely for me. I, I've been really letting my fleshly nature have the upper hand. I haven't been walking in the character of Christ. I've been, I've been a character, but I haven't been letting that character flow through me. And I want, I want, to, I want that love flowing out from me. I want that joy. I want that peace, quietness, and rest in my heart. I want to ask you just to do one thing. If this message was especially for you, just slip up your hand and put it back down and I'll know, yes, God bless you. God bless you. Pray with me, all of you now. Say, Heavenly Father, I am your child. I belong to you. And I'm born of your spirit. I have Zoe, the life and nature of God inside my heart help me father to live my life as my inward nature directs for if I walk in the spirit I'll live a life like Christ pleasing you I will live a life that reflects the character of Christ I have that love in me. I have your joy. I have your peace. Because Christ lives in me. Strengthen my inward man. Help me, Father, to walk by the Spirit. Not just here, in your house, but back home, in my house. Thank you, Father. With your help, I believe I shall do it every day. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Lift up your hands right now. Just, just praise the Lord right now. Why don't we thank Him? Why don't we just thank Him right now? Thank God for His mercy. Thank God for His mercy. Let me say this to you. Notice that verse, our text didn't say, if you don't satisfy the desires of the flesh, you'll be in the Spirit. He didn't say that. It's the other way. If you walk in the Spirit, yeah. you won't satisfy the desires of the flesh. Instead of concentrating on not doing what's wrong, concentrate, it, concentrate on doing what God wants you to do every day. If you do that, the rest will fall into place. Amen. Amen. Well, we love you. We appreciate you. What a joy it is to be with all of you again today. God bless you.